All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another installment of the Conquer Your Inner Critic interview series. I'm your host, Jim Posner, and today we have a guest, and his name is Ben Foley. Ben is a very successful blogger and speaker. His website is fullyrichlife.com. He's also a very popular writer on Medium. So, Ben, on the About section of your website, there's a picture of you and your fiance and the following description. This picture pretty much sums up who I am and what I'm about. I love with a full heart because for a time, I thought I would never feel love again. I'm a man, I have anxiety, I have experienced the depths of darkness and I still struggle, but I'm no longer controlled by it. I'm trying to allow the light to shine through the darkness. It's a daily battle. I write, I speak, I ask questions, I'm on the journey to discover what my meaning in life is. I help others who are on the same journey. I believe it's the most important journey we can embark on. So, wow, you know, uh, there's really a lot there. You've really opened up and let your proverbial guard down. And I think that's really, really admirable, especially, you know, as a Western man, where we're not supposed to show our vulnerabilities. Um, and I can, as you know, we, we've spoken, and as you know, I can really relate to a lot of what you've been through. Um, so, you know, you stated that you, you have anxiety and have experienced the depths of darkness, and you still struggle. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that means and, you know, the journey? Definitely. Yeah. Well, Jim, thanks again for uh, having me here on this, um, you know, webinar and, and, and in this series, it's, it's a really, really huge honor. Um, but yeah, so my story kind of starts about almost three years ago. Now um, I was uh, interning at a finance firm in New York city and kind of had spent the whole, the whole summer just kind of drinking and working, you know, 80, 90 hour weeks. And, and really just not taking care of my mental or physical health whatsoever. Um, and kind of the last weekend, actually, six days before I was turning 23, I, you know, experienced my first um, panic attack on a subway um, in New York City. Um, wow. And so that was my first experience ever dealing with that kind of darkness, that pain, that fear of kind of, you know, and I'm sure anybody who's had a panic attack understands just that that raw motion that kind of, you know, takes over your entire mind and body. And so that was kind of the first um, instance and that kind of drug on for the next 18 months of kind of searching and using, you know, self medicating with alcohol and, and just trying to, you know, work my way through this, not opening up, not telling anybody, even my fiance, as you said, um, you know, pictured there, but, um, you know, no one knew it was just inside. Cause as you said, as Western men, we're supposed to, we're supposed to keep it all inside, right? We feel, we feel weak or, you know, feel like we'd be labeled as, as less of a man if we had pain. And so, um, that's kind of what I did. Um, but then after about 18 months, I, I moved back to New York city and, you know, somebody gave me, um, the full catastrophe living book, which I know you've, you've read and, you know, have a lot more experience than I do. But, um, that book really opened, opened my mind, opened my, you know, hope that there is another way that I could heal myself, um, you know, with mindfulness and, um, you know, kind of using natural holistic tools to really heal myself. And so that's kind of my journey, but, you know, anxiety, like pretty much everything else is, is, is always going to be there. Um, you know, fear is never going to go away. You know, anger is never going to go away. Um, and so I've come to accept that, but now I'm able to, whenever it does come, it doesn't, you know, affect me like it used to. I, I can feel it in my body and I can move forward. And that's, you know, hugely thankful to what we're talking about here on this series and, and mindfulness and just being able to work with those emotions. Wow. What, uh, that must have been terrifying to go through that on a New York City subway. Um, can you actually describe what it's like? just the physical sensations and what may have, what the, you know, what the feeling was like in your, in your body and, and your mind at that yeah. moment. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you know, that morning I, I kind of woke up a little bit hungover from the night before and was on my way to meet some, 
some friends and things in, in Manhattan um, for brunch. And so I was just sitting on the train, uh, you know, kind of foggy already. And this just warmth just took over my entire body, right? And, and immediately the first thing my brain told me was, you're going to die. Um, because my heart was just pumping so fast. You know, you, you think about, oh, I'm going to have a, I'm having a heart attack, right? Like you, you've heard these stories about people that their heart just keeps going out of control and they have a heart attack. And so that just immediately perpetuated to the whole body of just feeling it in the stomach of just pain. And, and, you know, it, my mind became foggy and I literally thought I was dying. Um, that's the best way I, I couldn't like see and, and immediately when we got to the next, um, subway stop, I had to bolt off the train and, and, and basically vomit straight on, on the platform. Um, because it just everything inside of me felt like it was exploding. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, feeling is something that I dealt with for a long time, just kind of on the cusp of it happening again. Right. And, you know, I think that, you know, scientifically that's called like panic disorder, always feeling like you're going to have a panic attack. And so that was what I really dealt with. Just that kind of the feeling in the stomach, the tense jaw, the tense chest. Um, and it was something that I, you know, never would wish on my worst um, enemies to experience. Yeah. Un unfortunately I've been there and can relate all too well. So when that first, when you had that first major panic attack, and right after you vomited on the platform, did you go to the doctor or the hospital or anything at that point? Or what, what, what did you do? Yeah, so for me, my, both my parents are doctors. Um, and so I immediately was sitting on, you know, I think it was 3rd Avenue and 57th Street in the middle of Manhattan, New York, like looking for a cop or a taxi because I thought I was dying. I was like, I need to go to the hospital. Um, I, I don't know what's happening. And so I called my mom who's in Colorado and was like, I don't know what's happening, but my, like, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm having a heart attack. Um, and immediately that was, you know, within minutes, she's like, you're having a panic attack. You're anxious. And I think that experience of being, you know, wiring my mind already to label myself as an anxious person from the immediate moment it happened was something that was the biggest, um, biggest barrier to get over. And so she's like, just go home and, and all that stuff. And so basically I was leaving New York to go back to Indiana university for my senior year, um, a couple of days, um, from then. So I like, I've gotten a cab, went home, um, took a ton of like Tums and, and tried whatever I could. Cause I thought it was a stomach thing. I thought it was fear, but I just couldn't, I couldn't even get in the elevator to go up to my apartment. Um, and then, you know, a couple of days later I was heading to DC to meet up with my sister for my 23rd birthday and had another panic attack on the side of the highway. And, and I, I had to stop at a gas station and sleep there. And, and I bought, you know, cigarettes. I, I did whatever I thought I could to calm myself down. Um, but eventually once I got back to Indiana, um, I did see, you know, a therapist, um, just a normal therapist and, you know, kind of went down the path that most people do, right? Like, Oh, you have an anxiety disorder. Here is, you know, Xanax, you know, take this amount each day and, and try to, um, you know, come back in the, every week for the next six months and, and we'll see how your progress is. And, you know, I tried it for the first time and, you know, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like this is right. And so I only took, you know, medication once in, you know, that whole 18 month period. Uh, but like I said, I was definitely self-medicating with alcohol to really be able to kind of operate on a normal level. Wow. Well, you know, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, again, as somebody who's experienced a similar, similar bout of anxiety um, over a prolonged period, um, you know, it's, I think it's important. People that have not gone through it just don't understand how paralyzing it can be. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have to say, before this happened to me also, and m mine was event driven in the sense that, you know, I went through a layoff and my wife was pregnant and that's when the anxiety just mm -hmm. skyrocketed. I never thought I was anxious before. And I always felt like people that were depressed or had anxiety, I felt like it was them using, using it as an excuse for, uh, you know, not working hard or whatever, it, whatever it may be. But, you know, after having gone through it, it is just paralyzing. And then, you know, you talk about, having a second panic attack on the highway. And then, you know, 
you start to have multiple panic attacks, and I went through it also, you really start to wonder if you're ever going to be able to function again. And if, you know, if, if I was ever going to be able to hold down a job because I was having these anxiety attacks and, you know, obviously I had two really bad ones, but a lot of kind of like mini ones throughout the day where I was just fighting it. Mm. So in any event, I think it's great to, you know, for people to hear and understand um, how paralyzing it is. So let me ask you, Ben, you, you kind of were in New York City and you had your first panic attack. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you said for, you know, 18 months after you, you were fighting this. So before that, was the incident on the subway like the culmination of kind of maybe mini bouts of anxiety that you were going through where you, you know, did, could you kind of feel it building up? You know, at, at the time, I definitely couldn't, right? Like, I think that um, at the time in the present moment, I had, it didn't feel like anything was building up. It didn't feel like anything was different. Um, but, you know, retroactively, as I look back and try to kind of understand what those triggers were, what the culminating, you know, what, what added up to that culmination, um, I can definitely see it, right? I mean, I had, you know, spent the whole summer working all, you know, 80 hours a week on my internship. And then at night and weekends, my roommate and I were trying to start this, you know, startup on the side. And so I wasn't hanging out with anybody. I was working all the time. We were, you know, smoking pretty much every night um, to just kind of fall asleep. And then on the weekends drinking, you know, all the time. Um, so like that lifestyle was pretty, you know, obviously attributed. And then at, at the other side, I just, you know, it kind of looked back on history and kind of where I was heading in my life. And I just, that summer was just so like, I don't think like I had, you know, I had the finance job in New York city paying me the money I thought I always wanted. And it just felt so empty. And I think that, you know, kind of internally, I was going back to my final year of school and just kind of more lost than I had ever been. Um, and, and I think the reason why I was working so hard and drinking and, and doing all these things was to prevent that. Right. And I think that the moment that for whatever reason, like you said, it, it just all culminated into this one panic attack. Um, it was uh, it definitely was revolutionary for me once I started diving in introspectively being like, OK, these are the lifestyle things that were in misalignment. And if you want to get back to a normal person and, and be better, right, then you need to change them. Um, and so that is uh, that. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I didn't I didn't think, you know, I would never categorize myself as anxious, you know, I was stressed or or stuff like that. But now I look back, I was always kind of stressed. I was always kind of guilty. Right. I was always kind of feeling shame or, or not not doing enough to be the person I wanted to be. That was kind of my always my uh you know state of mind i wasn't you know the i never was like laughing or having good fun because i was working right i was goes i needed to get the grades i needed to be xyz for somebody um and so now looking back on it it's pretty apparent where the uh where the uh you know steps came from so actually to uh piggyback on you taking a step back can you tell us a little bit more about how you grew up and uh as you're saying, you, you do, in retrospect, real, think that some of that may have played a role in, you know, your, your anxiety, but uh, maybe if you could elaborate a little bit more on what kind of, you know, crowd you, you were friendly with when you were growing up, and just so we can get a sense of uh, maybe where some of this, you know, the genesis of some of this was. Definitely. So, um, you know, I was born in Indianapolis, um, moved to Colorado as a, as a seventh grader, um, was raised in a very, you know, very Christian, um, conservative family that, you know, went to church two, three times a week, um, you know, was always, you know, if you, if you have sex, if you drink, if you do anything, then you're, you know, going to hell. And I think that's where a lot of the guilt comes from. Um, I think that, you know, if any, you know, if you're raised Christian or Catholic or, or whatever religion, I think you're kind of ingrain that sense of guilt that whatever you're doing is not enough. Um, and so from an early age, I felt like an outsider to my entire family. Um, and it always felt like I needed to prove to them that I could, I could do it not following that path. Um, you know, and so 
in, in, in high school that translated into basketball. And then I went on to play college basketball and, and just always trying to, you know, get affirmation from them that even though I didn't believe in, in the specific religion that they did or whatever, I was still worthy of their, you know, of their love of their trust. And, and I think that played a huge role. Um, but ultimately, I, I transferred from the school I was playing basketball at, moved to Indiana University, which is a large party school, um, joined a fraternity and just, you know, kind of all of my kind of high school and, and kind of focusing more on, on, on like learning and reading and all that stuff kind of stopped. Um, and, and I got on the finance track and the drinking track. And all I cared about was, you know, getting that job and, and having fun drinking four or five nights a week. Um, you know, for, for four years is, is a huge toll. Um, but it was what everybody was doing, right. It was what everybody that I knew in my, you know, proximity was going out to the bars Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I didn't know any different. Right. And then, um, I think that all that kind of stuff culminated when I was first, you know, in New York city alone, um, you know, kind of really trying to, basically just mesh all these pieces and i think that the panic attack was just finally like my the body was like you know you're moving in way too many directions i'm just going to stop you um and that's what i've told a lot of people i'm like so happy that that happened because i think a lot of times this stuff culminates when people are 40 50 60 years old and then they look back on their life and they're like holy you know what happened you know like what what was going wrong um, and so I'm so grateful that it happened when I was, you know, 23, obviously I would never wish it on somebody that, you know, anybody, you know, I, it, it, no matter how much I dislike them, it was just such a, you know, trying period. But, um, you know, I think that period too, after of kind of going back to the fraternity and, and, and just kind of being thrown into this culture that drinks and, you know, takes drugs recreationally, um, and, and just kind of dealing with that. Um, as well as I know we talked about before, a lot of, a lot of close people to me have, have been, you know, have committed suicide. And so I think is immediately once I had the anxiety or stress, I, I kind of moved my mind towards like, oh, am I going to become one of them? Um, and so I think that that is kind of, you know, that's kind of my background. But um, yeah, I hope that helps. No, definitely. I think it's a really interesting story. And I think probably one that many, many people can relate to. And, you know, you, just talking about the, the breakdown, uh, I was listening to a podcast on Unmistakable Creative, which mm -hmm. is a great podcast series, highly recommended, really good, interesting guests and conversations. Uh, and there was a conversation with this guy that was a, a, a bank robber, actually. And right. he had this quote, uh, I had a breakdown, but actually it was a breakthrough. And, you know, that's kind of what it sounds like, you know, you're describing a little bit. And that's the way I feel also about when I really had my, my bad panic attack. You know, I really, I had, it was a breakdown and it, it made me reevaluate a lot of things and um, Definitely. move through them. So, so here we are now. Your, your yep. path away from having anxiety paralyze you and you know as you alluded to and we, anybody that deals with this knows you, you never you know you never really vanquish mm -hmm. it's always i think that there's a quote in the book you know it's always out in the parking lot doing push-ups you know waiting to come back in and, and, and get and so or, or maybe that was an allusion to bad habits or something but in any event the, the point is is that you know it's always kind of in the background. So what did you do? What was your, what was kind of your way through dealing uh, with, yeah. the, with the anxiety? How'd you, how'd you find your way up? Definitely. Um, so like I said that I kind of, uh, you know, graduated my senior year, still kind of struggling, moved to Chicago to take a, uh, you know, financial consulting job. Um, you know, it's kind of spending most days like in such fear that I was going to have a panic attack in a meeting that I would like, you know, freak out. Like you said, the biggest fear as a man, I think is that, Oh shit, I'm not going to be able to keep this job to support my family. I'm going to be, you know, this low life male that I've kind of pictured in my mind that I would not want to be. And so basically, like I said, my realization came really early 
um, after quitting my job in, in Chicago and moving to New York on my own, which was a huge thing for me, right? I think that getting out of your comfort zones, what I tell a lot of people that I work with is like, you know, to, to grow, you actually have to do something. A lot of times when you have anxiety or stress or whatever you're dealing with, you're waiting for like, okay, I'm going to get X amount better and then I'm going to do something, but you're never going to get there. And that's what I think I was doing for 18 months. I was waiting like, okay, Ben, like once you, you're kind of, kind of like get better as time goes on and then you're going to start like really developing yourself and, and getting through this anxiety or you're not right. And that's the biggest fear is that, like you said, is that it's never going to get better. But I think moving to New York on my own, moving to a place that I've never been to before, taking a job, making half the money um, at a startup in New York that I, you know, just really was interested in was a huge stepping stone for me. And really it was spur of the moment. Um, I, I was, somebody reached out to me and, and a past company I'd, I'd, I'd started in college was kind of, uh, you know, kind of worked well with what they were doing. They're like, Hey, would you be interested if we have an opening? And I was like, yeah. And, and my uh, now fiance and I talked about it and over dinner one night and I, and I was there the next week. And so um, I think I needed the quick, quickness of that to happen, but moving to New York and getting out of my comfort zone and being alone, which was scary for me, obviously was huge. And then from there, it's just kind of been a, what now about 15, 16 months of just complete emergence. You know, I think Jerry Colonna of reboot podcast calls it, you know, radical self inquiry. And, and I think that started, you know, as I was looking for an apartment, I was, I was in a bookshop in Brooklyn and that's where I found full catastrophe living literally within the first week I moved to New York. I found it. I was like, what, what the hell is mindfulness, right? Like I've pictured this, you know, kind of dude with dreads and incense coming up and, and these weird like bed sheets behind them. I always pictured a bald guy. for some Yeah, reason. <laughs> exactly. Uh, we all have this picture, especially when you were raised under, you know, Christianity, anything that sounds any what Eastern religious is crazy and, not stuff, but I was like, okay, I'm going to read this. And, and what caught my, caught my eye really was like on the top, it's like used in medical centers all over the world. And I was like, wait, what? This is used in medical centers? Obviously it has to have some legitimacy. And so basically read that book and, you know, I've read over a hundred book, 150 books since then. Um, not all on mindfulness, but basically all on, you know, self-growth, um, inquiry, you know, it started with, you know, kind of the typical Tony Robbins and those, but it's kind of more gone into kind of deeper psychology and, and how to really work with your brain. Um, and I think that reading that book gave me the first agency over my anxiety that I'd had since it started, right? That, oh, you can do things to make this better. And so I've basically just been hacking and trial and error and experimenting with whatever I can, you know, cold showers, meditation, you know, all these different things and, and have kind of come up with, you know, kind of a, a system or a, a routine for myself, um, you know, to kind of get better. But I think that really what I did as, as I kind of, like I said, I looked at these kind of buckets of my life, right? Like where you live, what you do, who you are with, like your physical health, um, all these things that, you know, if they're in misalignment, you're, you're going to be anxious, you're going to be stressed, you're going to be angry. Um, and I was misalignment in all of them. I was doing something I didn't like. I was living somewhere I didn't like. I had no good, close, deep relationships besides for my fiance. Um, and my physical health was really not in great shape. And so, you know, obviously, as I started putting stuff in those buckets, I started getting better. Um, and, and I've just continued that, right? And I think one thing that switched for me, too, was that beforehand, I was my getting through stress and anxiety was, a, was an alternate, like an alternative goal for me, right? Alternative to getting more money making it my career, ex, like all these other goals that we have in our life. And it, for some reason, this thing that was controlling so much of my life wasn't the number one priority that I wanted to deal with. And when I moved to New York, I was like, I don't care about anything else. I'm just going to go to work and do whatever they tell me. I'm only focusing on this anxiety for the next six months. And that was it, right? I turned my mind to be like, I'm going to focus only on this. It doesn't matter how much money I make. It doesn't matter because honestly, it doesn't matter if I'm still going to be like this 10 years from now. Um, and I think just making that commitment that, you know, that I don't want the rest of my life to be stressed, overwhelmed, anxious, you know, all these emotions and, and stresses that I had, I didn't want that for me. And so I think that those kind of the combination of moving to New York, getting that book and, and committing to, to one single goal was were just you know astronomical 
for, for kind of my growth out of, uh, out of kind of the debilitating anxiety. So I believe you said from our previous conversations that you, you've taken a mindfulness based stress reduction <clears throat> meditation course, correct? Yeah, I have. So when, when was the first one that you took, uh, when was the first one that you took, uh, you know, a post? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I'm sure people kind of watching, maybe they haven't full catastrophe living that book that I've been talking about is kind of the, uh, the step-by-step mindfulness based stress reduction, um, in book form that was created by John Kabat-Zinn at, at mass general. Um, and so I, the first kind of intro into that was the book. And then I was like, okay, well this book's good, but I want to be around, you know, people. I want to be, you know, kind of have one-on-one teachers and I really want to, you know, immerse myself deeper. And so, um, I did that the, in, during the middle of like last year it was my first eight week course. Um, and it was amazing. Right. And I was sitting there and I was like, Oh, I have anxiety. And I was looking at somebody who is, who is about to die in the next couple of months, um, who was taking this course to, to kind of eradicate her end of death, you know, end of life anxiety. And I was like, wow, this is powerful. And people were having breakthroughs, which I'm sure you've, you've seen. And, you know, there's a guy that I can remember who was a real estate agent who, you know, at the first couple of weeks was like, this is stupid. Like I, I'm not going to get anything out of this. My company's paying for it. So I'm just here. <laughs> um, and then I remember there's this one week where we're doing these, um, you know, kind of one-on-one how to, how to respond to different types of, you know, stimuli. And so you're like either pushing someone or you're, you're you know, kind of like moving away from them and all these things. And, and basically you're supposed to visualize the other person that's approaching you as something that you're struggling with your anxiety or whatever. And, and this guy, he, you know, I have no idea what he's visualizing, but on the last kind of, you know, kind of intermittent thing of this, he, he basically pushes this guy back and is like, I am finished. And he just starts bawling. And it was just like, Oh, this is insane. Like this guy just had a massive breakthrough in front of us. And I think that that community that the in person was huge for me. Um, and I'm actually now in my second course going, um, you know, in a couple of days to my full day, uh, silent meditation retreat here in Chicago, which is going to be awesome. I, I, I haven't done any of the long, I know that you have, I haven't done any of the, the 10 day ones, which I'm hoping to get to this year as well. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, no, it was life altering for me also. I, I, again, I, uh, you know, when I started, I didn't know what meditation was, but I was in such a bad place that I was just willing to try anything. Mm-hmm. And when I took the course, um, I just was like, all right, I'm going to do whatever they say. And, mm-hmm just changed my life and really resonated for me. Yeah. I think that whole going all in or committing to be fully, you know, immersed is, is so key. I think it's so key, especially for, for mindfulness or for anything in life. I think it's, it's yeah. really key to get the most out of it. Definitely. So can you take us through a little bit of what your daily mindfulness practice entails? Definitely. So right now, I mean, I, I kind of am not the most, normal mindfulness practitioner. Um, but I do, I wake up every morning, I do about 20 to 30 minutes of meditation, just, just sitting, um, kind of on my couch, honestly, and and either I'm listening to, you know, headspace guided meditation or, or just kind of doing it without, um, any guided meditation, which is something I'm trying now just to kind of not have to rely on something else. You know, if I was out of the country or didn't have my phone, I would still want to be able to practice well. And so, that's kind of my first thing I do every single morning. Um, and then I also journal, which I think for me has been revolutionary. Um, writing to me is so is, is mindfulness in another form, right? It's you're putting thoughts on the paper. You're there's all of these things that you you're becoming aware, right? Like I was on a bus the other day and I was just more aware of my surroundings because I wanted to write about them. Right. And so I was like, Oh, that billboard says this, or, Oh, look at that grass color. You know, that is, to me, mindfulness. And so that's what writing has really helped. And then I also do, you know, kind of a, a morning cold shower, which is, you know, physiologically awesome, but it's also a mindfulness practice for me because every time I turn that shower cold, I don't want to be there. Right. And right. so I'm practicing that whole, you know, dealing and accepting of negative or, you know, bad, right. Emotions and, and letting them be and just staying there. Um, and so those are kind of the three things that I hit every single morning. Um, 
I definitely try to do mindful eating, but not as much as I, as I would like. Um, I think that's a great practice. Um, and another thing that I do as well is whenever I'm taking walks, I, I now don't take a phone or anything else. I'm just, I'm just going on the walk. Um, and, and just kind of observing one thing that I thought was really cool that I heard from James Altucher uh, was that when he's going for walks, he looks at, you know, kind of the, the, the highest point of a building, um, you know, kind of, kind of right by the roof. And that's where the architect has, has the most artistic, you know, leeway on the building project. And so if you look, there's a lot of really cool intricacies, there's, you know, the names or just all these different, you know, kind of textures and so I kind of like look for that, you know, it's kind of giving me something to look at and be aware of rather than mindlessly going from A to B. So just, just taking yourself off autopilot, which, uh, exactly. yeah, I used to live my life with my, my head down, you know, walk to the subway, no idea what's going on around me. I mean, there, there could have been a pregnant lady pushing a stroller in front of me, trying to get upstairs. And, you know, in my life before mindfulness, I wouldn't have noticed and I may have even kind of walked right by her and you know uh so it's yeah it's it's nice to take yourself off autopilot and uh see everything that there is to see no no doubt definitely so uh ben any any interesting projects coming up i know you just started something called the Manxiety Diaries, which uh, yeah. I read your first installment. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about that or any other new things that you have coming up? Yeah, so kind of my, uh, my main passion is kind of writing. Um, and I, I feel that kind of what we're talking about here and, and kind of men who deal with these darker things, um, you know, it's kind of spurred my passion for opening up more forums for men to tell their stories. And so, um, you know, kind of came up with this idea called the Manxiety Diaries, which is, you know, kind of completely attributed to New York Magazine's sex diaries, um, where they had people basically outline their sex lives for a week. Um, mine's a little bit different, but it's, it's, it's kind of allowing people to tell their stories, to tell what they're dealing with, to tell kind of on a, on a daily basis, kind of the anxieties, the stresses, what their thought patterns are as, as really a, a vessel for others to maybe going through something else to realize that they're not alone. Right. And I think that was huge for me. Um, when I was dealing with this, I felt like every other male wasn't. And I just felt so alone, like you're weak, like all these other men are just like these big guys and big tough dudes, like doing all this, you know, crazy stuff. And I was like weak and couldn't even like get out of bed essentially. Um, and it wasn't until I read, you know, Sebastian Junger's story of his panic attack on a subway station and his really good article, um, it was called Bonds of Battle, which is about kind of PTSD and, 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 and kind of veterans who deal with stress and anxiety and things like that. And he wrote a really good article for Vanity Fair called um, Bonds of Battle, which turned into his book called Tribe. Um, you know, a friend sent me that when I was sitting, you know, in a coffee shop in Chicago, right before I moved to New York. Um, and it was basically, he talked about his story of kind of having a panic attack on a subway in New York. And for whatever reason, that was the first time I was like, whoa, like somebody else dealt with this, you know, and it was so resonant to me because it was on a subway station in New York and Sebastian Junger is like the most manly human being ever. Um, and so I was like, wow, this is awesome. And, and so I started seeking out more and more stories and found, you know, Tim Ferriss who tells his story about suicide and then all, you know, Dan Harris who wrote 10% happier, who tells his story. And, and the more and more I gained these stories, the more and more I felt normal um, and didn't feel alone. And so that was, that's my, kind of my genesis for this my Anxiety Diaries is, is to open up more of those, you know, stories and, and kind of write about just kind of this, this human condition that we kind of all deal with. Um, and so that's kind of something I'm really, really interested in. It's kind of like a passion project. Um, but yeah, man, just yeah, kind of my right now is just creating really great content for my readers on my blog and, and trying to, you know, attack this, these, you know, these issues of mindfulness and stress and in ways that, you know, are, are resonant with readers and really give them action items to use it in their day versus kind of the, you know, click through click baity articles that you often see. Um, and so that's kind of what I'm really focusing on right now. Great. Great. Really, uh, really want to, Thank you for your time here today. I think it's been really enlightening. And again, it's important for people to realize that, you know, 
that, it, that are people that, who are going through this, that you're not alone. And mm -hmm. you just alluded to that a second ago. And I, I think that's one of the most important concepts that I'm trying to, to uh, bring about with this Conquer Your Inner Critic series um, by just bringing awareness to, to the fact that, you know, a lot of people deal with this and uh, are able to move through it. So again, I want to thank you for your time and uh, everybody it's fullyrichlife.com and look for Ben Foley on Medium as well. Really good writer. I really enjoy reading all of his blog posts and I'm sure all my viewers will as well. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Jim, for having me. You're welcome.